19 pandemic and pursuant to his executive orders declaring a public health emergency and recent amendments to the Open Meetings Act, we continue to operate under permission to conduct our meeting without physical attendance requirements. As head of this public body, I find it not prudent or practical to hold an in-person meeting or to have staff or any other member of the board at our headquarters during this meeting. As a reminder, closed captioning is now available for our board meetings. WebEx attendees can access the closed captioning by clicking on the, uh, the participants um, uh, link and then select media viewer. Those watching on YouTube can simply click the CC button in the bottom right menu. So let's review the guidelines for today's meeting. Keep your audio on mute as much as possible in order to minimize background noise, which uh, may impair the recording. When you have a question or comment, please raise your virtual hand. Uh, Audrey will call on board members who have raised their hands uh, one at a time. I think uh, most of you are pretty good at this by now. When she calls on you, lower your hand and unmute before you begin speaking. Uh, when we get to voting, please raise your hand to make a, a motion or a second. Audrey will uh, identify who's making the motion in the second for the record. And after she announces the motion in the second, uh, please lower your hand. Uh, any questions at this time for, for me or for the Madam Secretary? Seeing none, um, we will now call this uh, meeting of the Board of Directors of the Regional Transportation Authority to order. Um, I will recite the Pledge of Allegiance as we were discussing uh, previously. Probably uh, maybe even has more meeting today than it, uh, it did a couple of weeks ago. So uh, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Madam Secretary, can you please call the roll? Certainly. <laughs> Director Andalcio? Yeah. Director Canty? Here. Yeah. Director Carey? Here. Director Colson? Here. Here. Aye. 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 Director Fuentes. Director Fuentes. Here. Okay. Director Gavin. Here. Director Groven. Here. Director Holt. Present. Director Cotel. Here. Director Lewis? Here. Director Melvin? Here. Director Pang? Director Ross? Present. Director Sager? Director, Director Sager? I know I saw you. I Can you unmute, Director Sager? Present. Thank you. Chairman Dillard? I am present. Thank you. 16 present with no absent. Great. And thank you very much for uh, your continued great attendance, as always. Um, item 3A is the approval of minutes from the board meeting we held on December 17th of last year, 2020. Are there any comments or corrections? If not, um, I'll ask for a motion and a second to approve these minutes uh, as submitted. Please remember to use your hand raising tool so uh, Audrey, our secretary, can identify uh, who is making the motion and the second. Dalcio has moved and Director Canty has seconded. Great. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Will you uh, I'm sorry, if you're not speaking, we'll need you to put your microphones on mute. I don't know if anyone else can hear the echoing, but it's pretty bad. 
So on the minutes, we have 16 ayes and no nays. Okay, great. Item four is the public comment section of the meeting. Uh, we've always asked the public to submit their comments by electronic mail. Um, are there any comments received this morning, um, Madam Secretary? We have received no public comment. Okay, great. Then we will move on to item five, uh, which is the executive director's report. Uh, and uh, Jeremy will be reporting for Leanne today, who had a little planned surgery. Uh, Leanne may be on the line listening to us. Hope she's doing well. Uh, but Jeremy, it's, it's all yours. Thanks. Uh, you can hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. I won't attempt an Australian accent here. Uh, <laughs> good morning, Chairman Dillon and members of the board. Happy New Year, and, ha and we hope everyone had a safe and restful holidays. Our agenda today will focus on our continued progress in a three-step COVID recovery strategy. With this meeting, the board will embark on step two, executing, executing the 2021 budget and making decisions as needed to sustain critical transit service. Next slide. We completed step one in December with this board's approval of the 2021 budget. Today you will hear, and we will hopefully all discuss, the important decisions that will need to be made as part of step two. As you know, since our last meeting, a $900 billion COVID relief package became law on December 27th. The package sets aside approximately $14 billion for transit nationwide. The legislation dictates that no region in the U.S. can receive more than 75% of its total 2018 operating budget when combining funds received under this package and under the CARES Act, which provide $1.4 billion to the RTA region. As a result, we estimate that the greater Chicago urbanized area, area will receive about $486 million of additional relief funding. The memo that is part of your board packet and the presentations you will hear today will, we hope, provide you with the detailed information on our recommended process for distribution of these funds. But I want to stress two things. First, the goal of this process is to sustain critical transit services and provide mobility for those who, need most, who, who most need public transportation at this time including bus riders, essential workers, residents with economic hardships across the region, and people with disabilities. Therefore, our intention is that this discussion and any recommended action resulting from it will be unique and specific to relief funds from this new stimulus package. Starting in May, step three of the recovery process will be the forum for charting a longer term strategy for the regional transit system. And the second thing I want to underscore is that the RTA is committed to a transparent, accountable, and collaborative process for distribution of these funds and throughout every step of this recovery strategy. We are committed to collaboration with each of the three service boards and with our partners and stakeholders. In today's staff presentation, you will hear more about the specific actions we will take to ensure that transparency and accountability. Next slide. Moving on to the federal updates, the Georgia Senate runoff election on January 5th gave the Democrats two additional seats in the U.S. Senate for a total of 50. Because Republicans also have 50, Vice President Harris is now the tie-breaking vote. The result is that the Democratic control of the White House and both chambers of Congress make the prospects of additional federal infrastructure spending in 2021 more likely. Last week, prior to his inauguration, President Biden released the outline of a $1.9 trillion COVID relief proposal. It would include $350 billion for state and local government COVID relief, as well as $20 billion in additional transit relief funding. Full details of the president's proposal will be unveiled in the coming weeks. Beyond the additional transit recovery funding, its proposed assistance to state and local governments would help Illinois deal with its current, un currently unbalanced 21 budget, possibly allowing the state to avoid additional budget cuts that could affect transit funding. As early as February, President Biden may also unveil a larger infrastructure spending package that could include a surface transportation reauthorization bill. As negotiations move forward with a narrow Democratic majority in the Senate, the new administration will likely need to forge bipartisan support for much of its agenda. We look forward to working with the new administration, our congressional delegation, APTA, and APTA in seeking additional federal investment for the region's transit system. In Springfield, the Illinois General Assembly met for a lame duck session last week prior to the swearing in of the 102nd General Assembly on January 13th. Chris Welch, who represents the 7th House District in the near Western suburbs, was elected the new Speaker of the House, replacing longtime House Speaker Michael Madigan. Both chambers of the General Assembly are scheduled to be in session off and on through May, 
and we will continue to monitor and report on any developments. Next slide. As a reminder of where we will go from here, beginning in May 2021, step three will encompass developments of a new five-year strategic plan for the region's transit system with an outlook toward 2023 and beyond. During step three, we will focus on taking the many lessons we have learned through this crisis and engaging you and other stakeholders to reimagine our transit system to support our region's full economic recovery. Next slide. The RTA Community Planning Program has worked on more than 200 projects since 1998, offering technical assistance and funding to local governments to address local planning needs where the issues of public transportation and land use intersect. Yesterday, our annual call for projects opened with a deadline of February 3rd. We are once again partnering with the CMAP Local Technical Assistance Program for a joint application process. Aside from its impact on transit, the COVID-19 pandemic has strained the capacity of local governments around the region like never before. Because of this, the focus this year will be to provide technical assistance to municipalities of high and very high need based on data or other factors such as population, income, and tax base per capita. On the RTA website uh, homepage, you will see more information with a link to apply. We ask for your help in spreading the word about this call. Next slide. And lastly, very quickly, here are the state delinquency figures for this month. Through the end of December, the state owes the RTA $187 million of ASA, AFA, and PTF. The state is six months behind on ASA, six months behind on AFA, and the equivalent of 4.2 months behind on PTF. And, and finally, the year-to-date cost of the short-term debt is $5.1 million. Thanks, and that concludes my report. Great. Any questions or, or comments here? Thank you, Jeremy, very much. And hopefully Leanne is uh, up. Director yep. Andalcio has a question. Yes, sir. David. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, based on, on the strategy for the COVID-19 strategy, I just wanted to notate understanding that we don't have a crystal ball in what the future guarantees. And I do comprehend that there will probably be or will be a needs analysis by all the service boards for additional funding just want to verbalize and have some assurance that there will be some proactive thinking on the suburban communities that are that is service, such as DuPage County. Um, I just want to make sure all avenues and needs will be assessed and will be considered and discussed funding distributions. Again, I'm sure all the service boards will provide a needs analysis, but I just want to you know, take a deeper dive in thinking the funding is the suburban community. No, they they, cer they certainly will, Director Andalcio, and obviously we want to be very transparent here. Uh, the discussions will be uh, will will be hard, but uh, you know we will we will clearly um, be looking at all three service boards um, geographically where uh, we will distribute the money, uh, and you know we'll have a robust discussion. You know, and Jill may touch on the COVID nineteen uh, recovery strategies and money a little bit. Uh, uh, in a, in a couple of seconds as well, but no, David, you're 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 right on, and we will we will make sure that that uh, you know that happens. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Thank you, sir. Um, next is uh, uh, item six A, and that's a report on the monthly financial results uh, going back to, for October of 2020. Um, B, are are you on, and you're going to do this part of the uh, the meeting? Y yes, I am. Um Mr. Chairman and directors, good morning. This is B. Raina Hickey, Chief Financial Officer. Today I will cover the year-to-day financial results. Could we bring up the next slide, please? Today I will cover the year-to-day financial results through November 2020. Results are now being compared to the Service Board 2020 estimates from October, adopted by the RTA Board as revised budgets in December. As we've stated the last couple of meetings, the service boards have developed an unanticipated constraint in the amount of CARES Act funding they can requisition, which may affect their year-end recovery ratios. But you need to keep in mind this is not a bad thing. This good expense performance is limiting the amount of CARES Act funding that can be requisitioned to break even. This will allow for more CARES Act money to be carried over. 
System ridership through November was about 1% higher than the amended budget, but almost 60% below prior year. CTA reported favorable to budget results while Metra and PACE suburban service ridership results were more than 3% unfavorable, which is highlighted in red. ADA paratransit ridership has exceeded the expectations of the amended budget by 16%, highlighted in light blue. This is driving the expense higher and creating an additional funding need, which I will discuss later. Next slide, please. <coughs> Total operating revenue of 955.4 million was 64.7 million or 6.3% unfavorable to budget, and which is highlighted in red. Each service board, including ADA paratransit, reported unfavorable operating revenue in excess of 3%. But due to better than expected sales tax results and good expense performance, the service board's CARES Act requisitions have fallen short of budget, particularly for Metro. A key point to remember is that CARES Act funding can only be used to bring actual financial results to a break-even condition. Next slide, please. Looking at system right operating expense through November, it was 42.1 million or 1.7 favorable to the amended budget. CTA expense was 22 million under budget, while Metro and Pace had larger percentage variances as they continue to operate significantly reduced schedule. ADA paratransit expense is 8.9 million or almost 6% unfavorable to budget due to better than expected ridership. As a result, ADA has developed a funding need on top of the 31.4 million of reserve funding that was approved by the board in September. Next slide, please. Okay, I think we're off a slide. We should be on the recovery ratio slide. Okay, net results. There we go, there we go. Okay, as I alluded to earlier, even with 487.4 million of CARES Act funding included, the regional recovery ratio has fallen below 50% through November, now at 48.9% and 1.8 percentage points below budget. Each service board has an unfavorable recovery ratio, most prominent in the Metro results, which is ironic because Metro has achieved the greatest expense reduction from the original 2020 budget. Once again, this mathematical result has developed because of better than expected sales tax and the discipline expense performance, limiting the amount of CARES Act funding which will be needed for 2020, which is a good thing. We are actively discussing options to meet the 50% year-end recovery ratio requirement with the service boards and will keep the board apprised. In summary, 2020 is not done giving us problems to resolve yet. We'll have more to report on the proposed solutions to both the ADA funding situation and the revenue recovery ratio, which may include a revenue adjustment at the regional level for revenue recovery purposes only. This concludes my remarks. I'll try to answer any questions the board may have. Uh, back to you, Mr. Thank you, uh, B. Um, and I wanna thank our congressional delegation and their staff that, uh, who've been uh, tremendous here uh, in helping us through these, these difficult times. Any questions of our chief financial uh, Officer, or comments here? I'm checking. I do not see any hands, so that would be a no. Great, thank you. Thank um, you. Item 6B is a report on the step two of the COVID-19 uh, recovery strategy, and um, Jill Leary will uh, brief the board on, on this critical uh, endeavor we are, we are working with her on. Jill? Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. I'm here to give you an update about step two of the RTA COVID-19 recovery process. Next slide. You'll recall that we outlined a regional COVID-19 recovery plan last October. It consists of three steps. The first step is to adopt a 2021 budget that reflects the current crisis. We finished that in December. The second step is to execute the 2021 budget and make decisions as needed to sustain transit during a time of uncertainty. This step is underway now, and we are here to talk about it today. 
The third step we, we will, will, will be to engage in a strategic recovery planning and consider how to reinvent transit. And as we heard uh, earlier today, we hope to begin that in May. Next slide. In October, we also outlined a set of policy priorities to guide each step toward COVID-19 recovery. These include first to identify immediate funding solutions to support the transit system, including advocating for federal aid, exploring new revenue solutions, and considering how to leverage resources to meet short-term needs most effectively. Additionally, that critical transit services are sustained to provide mobility for those who most need public transportation at this time, including bus riders, essential workers, residents with economic hardships across the region, and people with disabilities. And overall, to take an increasingly transparent collaborative approach to communicating with stakeholders in the public about projected budget shortfalls, impending cuts, and other potential disruptions to service. Next slide. Today, we will focus on step two of the recovery process. Again, the objective of this step is to execute and make decisions as needed to sustain critical transit. The process will involve discussing topics related to the three policy priorities that will be helpful to you as the RTA board in your decision-making capacity. It will also culminate in several products or actions. We will be sharing with you work to date and asking for input on the process and the timeline. Next slide. The first question facing the RTA board is how to identify uh, immediate funding solutions. Recall that the adopted 2021 budget contains a $500 million gap. Our immediate priority has been to seek funding options to fill that gap and to determine a transparent and accountable process for allocating them. In December, RTA staff explored a variety of funding options practically available to the RTA board in the immediate 2021 timeframe. Four options were examined, including seeking federal relief, seeking state relief, reallocating existing funds on an emergency basis, and undertaking short-term borrowing. Exploring these options allowed RTA staff to prepare several courses of action and assess the viability of each to provide the funding necessary to avert service cuts that have threatened peer regions. Fortunately, a partial funding solution materialized in late December when Congress passed the second round of emergency COVID relief funding for transit nationwide. Again, the $900 billion COVID relief package directs approximately $14 billion to transit agencies nationwide, including about $486 million to the greater Chicago urbanized area. While the estimated additional funding available to the RTA region is not fully sufficient, to fill the region's 2021 budget gap, RTA staff recommends that the RTA board shift focus in the near term to allocating the newly acquired federal funds as we'll discuss today. RTA staff will also continue to explore additional funding solutions as referenced in this table to bolster transit in 2021 and beyond and bring information to the board as needed. Next slide. The second question facing the RTA board is how to support the service board's efforts to sustain critical transit during this unique and unprecedented season. Mobility overall changed drastically in 2020 and continues to change, but around 500,000 weekday trips continue to be made on our transit system. Transit is critical. Many regions and transit agencies around the country have faced the prospect of unplanned cuts in, into 2021, which have been met with significant public outcry. In order to avoid this situation, RTA staff recommends that the board proactively state and gain regional consensus about the geographic areas in which it is critical to maintain transit presence throughout 2021, based on where transit is most likely to be used and most likely to be needed during recovery and use this as a basis for allocating federal relief funds. We will present more detail on this proposal in a moment when I finish going over the process. Next slide. The third key question facing the RTA board is how to undertake recovery efforts transparently and collaboratively. RTA staff continues to be committed to an ongoing and open dialogue with partners, the public and the civic community. RTA staff has and will continue to invite collaboration and share information with our partners at each of the service boards. 
and the RTA has also worked with local and national elected officials and partners such as the American Public Transit Association to advocate for federal relief. In addition, RTA staff recommends that the critical transit analysis and recommendations therein regarding funding allocations be subject to formal public comment. RTA staff will provide multiple venues for information, for information sharing and feedback and promote the public comment period targeting the most impacted stakeholders. Public comment will be shared with board members and incorporated into final recommendations as appropriate. Next slide. So this is the timeline that we are envisioning for the step two recovery. Today, our goal is to provide more detailed information on step two implementation and ask for feedback. In February, we hope to discuss progress and release proposed recommendations regarding relief fund distribution for public comment for a public comment period through Friday, March 5th, 2021. And in March, we will ask you to consider the recommended allocation and initiate a budget amendment for the 2021 operating budget. Starting in April, staff will continue to execute on step two while initiating step three. Additional detail on those next steps will be presented at that time. In a moment, I'm going to hand it off to Peter Kirsten, one of our analysts in our strategic uh, planning group to talk more about sustaining critical transit. But before that, I wanted to pause and take any feedback that you have on phase, uh, the process that we're suggesting for phase two. Any questions or, or comments on Jill's proposed plans here? I'm checking. I do not see any hands at this time. I will continue to scroll through during the presentation. All right. Thanks, Audrey. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. So now I'm going to hand this over to Peter, who will kind of get into the meat of this uh, and talk about how we uh, our analysis for sustaining critical transit. Peter, Peter will say this again, but if you have questions throughout his presentation, please don't hesitate to raise your hand and Audrey will call on you to help facilitate your questions. And with that, I'll turn it over to Peter. Thanks, Jill. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Jill. And uh, thank you to Chairman Dillard and the RTA board for having me here today. Um, it's my pleasure to be here virtually with all of you. Uh, go ahead to the next slide. So the second question that Jill mentioned is the subject of this presentation. How should the RTA board support the service board's efforts to sustain critical transit services? Next slide. So I'll first provide an update and some added detail on how people are moving generally throughout the region and more specifically how people are riding transit. Uh, I'll then walk through three ways we're defining critical need areas or transit CNAs, as we're calling them, transit CNAs. We'll, we'll kind of come back to that repeatedly here. Uh, and then lastly, we'll discuss uh, relating these transit CNAs or critical need areas to how transit service is provided by the three service boards throughout the region. How would we fund service to preserve mobility for these critical need areas? Um, I want to re re reiterate here, uh, Bill's mention of asking questions. This is a, a big presentation and that there's a lot of information. I'll stop at a couple points and uh, see if there are comments or questions, um, but please feel free to raise your hand uh, during the presentation and we'll try to address things in real time uh, as well. Next slide. So before getting too far, a couple of key points to keep in mind. Um, we, as we all know, the RTA represents a large and diverse constituency that is spread across a broad geography. Uh, performing this analysis at regional scale presents some inherent challenges. Uh, additionally, RTA sets funding levels, among other duties. The service boards plan and deliver transit to the region. region. Uh, this analysis does not address specifics of service planning, as we rightly leave that to the service boards. And then lastly, um, I'll say, uh, echoing uh, Jill's sentiment, this is a, a unique moment, and this discussion is specific to the world today. The world looked different before COVID, and while so many details are still uncertain, uh, we do know that the world will look different after the worst of the impacts uh, of the virus have passed. Next slide. Um, so first, an update on, on movement and transit use. Next slide. So we've shared previously and, and continue to update the RTA COVID-19 dashboard. The regional system is down around 70% year over year. 
uh, bus modes, CTA and PACE are performing better than rail modes. Uh, even with ridership down at these unprecedented levels, the regional system is still providing about half a million unlinked passenger trips per weekday. Uh, in addition to tracking transit trips, the COVID dashboard has also been looking at all regional travel. This data is pr produced by the company Replica and is largely uh, created using location-based services data or cell phone data. And it's provided to us through a partnership with IDOT. Uh, dating back to the first week of March, all travel, so not just transit trips or just work commutes, but all trips uh, are down about 38% year over year, or excuse me, dating back to March. Um, a significant decrease, uh, but as we've discussed, not nearly the decline seen in transit ridership. Next slide. So digging in a little further with, with Replica, uh, these maps show the percent change in trips by census tract, comparing February of 2020 to November of 2020. Uh, so we're looking at before COVID compared to the end of last year, the end of 2020. The blue areas of the map are where there is the least change. People are still moving in numbers relatively close to they were to what they were doing before COVID hit. Uh, the gray areas, or they may appear as white or kind of hollow, uh, depending on your computer screen, represent the tracks with the greatest declines in trips. Um, so you, this change from before COVID to the end of 2020, the gray areas are where people are not going. Uh, taking a quick look at the map, you can see uh, many key employment areas are in gray or white. Um, including O'Hare, Oak Brook, and DuPage County, the Lake County Corridor. Um, and on the inset map uh, of the city, you can see that the entirety of the loop in downtown Chicago is gray. So while people are moving in many areas of the region, the data suggests that people are still not traveling to some of these major employment areas. Next slide. So again, more replica data here. Uh, on the left is residential VMT or vehicle miles traveled. Uh, residential meaning people that live within the six county region. Uh, VMT has hovered at down about 50 to 25%, uh, again, dating back to the beginning of March. The figure on the right shows change in trips for private auto and transit. Um, and you can see private auto has certainly dipped, but not nearly as much as transit. But perhaps more importantly, um, VMT is lower than trips, suggesting people are still uh, getting out and about, they're making trips, but they're not going as far from home, uh, kind of confirming the previous map uh, that people are staying closer to where they live um, and traveling less overall. And when they are traveling, it's a shorter distance. Next slide. So now coming to ridership, um, the next four slides, we're going to look at ridership specific to the individual uh, modes and service boards. Um, and then also all data will be shown in year over year comparison. We're looking at Q3 of 2019 to Q3 of 2020. And the color scheme shows system wide average in yellow. Um, so everything on the next four maps that you see in yellow is down substantially, but it's about average to what the system is doing. Uh, everything in green uh, is above average, so it's down substantially across the board. Transit is down, but the areas in green are where we're seeing uh, rides that aren't down as much as the system average are performing a little better. There is a, a greater kind of relative demand. And then the areas in red are the opposite. They're, they're the areas that are down even further down um, than the regional average. So first taking a look at CTA rail, um, some trends begin to emerge. Uh, first thing you should see is that the loop, the loop is entirely red. Um, all of the train lines point there, but people in general are not boarding trains uh, in the loop. They're not traveling to the loop uh, measured in, in year over year change. Um, similarly, stations on the west and south sides are green. Uh, these lines have seen declines. Again, everything is down, uh, but measured as year over year change, they are performing better than the system wide average. Next slide. So now looking at CTA bus, um, overall bus has a lot of green. Uh, overall ridership is down. Again, it's down across the board, uh, but not as far down as the system wide average. Uh, as mentioned previously, both bus modes have performed better than rail in terms of year over year change. Uh, the bus routes showing up in red are largely those again serving downtown, kind of confirming the same trend we're seeing in the rail. Um, and then along, along Lakeshore Drive, some of these express services. Uh, as well as some other pockets such as the University of Chicago on the south side. 
Next slide. So now looking at the suburban bus mode, um, PACE has some similarities uh, in the express services running into the loop show up in red, um, while there are clusters of green in suburban Cook and then some of the satellite cities of the collar counties. So Joliet, Aurora, Elgin, Waukegan, you see these pockets of green. I'll also mention here that this, this again is change in ridership Q3 of 2019 to Q3 of 2020. The routes that are reflected here are only routes that are still active. So PACE has made substantial uh, service changes. We're not showing the routes that are currently suspended. Um, we're not showing, uh, we're only showing change of routes that are currently active. Um, but that should be acknowledged that this is a comparison to a different, different level of service from Q3 of 2019 to Q3 of 2020. Next slide. So looking at Metro, again, similar patterns emerge. All Metro lines serve the loop. All lines are below the regional system-wide average. Uh, again, measured in Q3 year-over-year -year change. Uh, notably, the Rock Island, Metro Electric, and UP North lines have all performed a little bit better than the other Metro lines. Um, the Rock Island and Electric both have quite a few stations within the city of Chicago and many serving areas um, that are further from CTA rail. Um, again, I'll reiterate here the same with PACE. We're, we're comparing Q3 of last year to Q3 or Q3 of 2019 to Q3 of 2020. And again, Metro has made substantial changes. So this map doesn't necessarily capture the amount of service that they're putting out. It is just showing the change in ridership here. Um, so before continuing, I want to pause there. Um, the, the purpose here is to give you kind of an update of some of the nuance of how people are riding, how people are moving through the region uh, before kind of getting into the next uh, next phase of the presentation. I hold, please. Director Holt has a question. Um, yes, Peter, would you talk a little bit about the, uh, or, or clarify a little bit for me, the point you made about service levels versus uh, ridership? Because of course those two things are connected. So let's take, uh, you know, Pace, for example, um, who has, uh, as you say, uh, you know, cut some service in some areas. Is that, is the reduction we're seeing relative to the level of service that's being provided? Um, or is there is there another factor there that I'm missing? Um, it, I would say the, the short answer is it's more complicated than that. Um, like for one thing to consider, the, the service boards need to operate, they need to not have packed trains and buses, which was always the goal before COVID. Um, so that there is gonna be um, some of a, a bit of a mismatch there where you want you know, 50% capacity or less. Um, so it's not a direct uh, relationship between ridership and service cuts. Um, it's more complicated than that. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. Um, okay, I do not see any other hands at this time. So you're welcome to continue. Okay, next slide. So with the updated understanding of where need exists as expressed in both ridership trends that we're seeing and then the movement data um, from Replica, we'll move now to defining these critical need areas. Pause. Uh, Director Melvin has his hand raised. Yes. Go ahead, Director Melvin. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Hey, Peter. Um, so on the Metra, on the Metra slide, we see a lot of red, but is that is that also from uh, have have the number of trips been reduced as well, or are we just seeing ridership that's declined on all trips? I'm, I'm just a little confused about that. The uh, for all four maps, including Metra, uh, we're showing ridership in comparison to Q3 of 2019 to Q3 of 2020. Um, Metro, with the way the data exists, it's the monthly totals. So for those three months of the quarter would be July, August, September. And we're discounting the total from how many people rode each line in those months of 2019. And then we're comparing that to how many people rode for each line in those months of, of 2020. Um, does that help? Yes, perfect. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Sure. Okay, I don't see any more hands at this point. 
All right. Uh, <clears throat> so with that updated understanding, we'll, we'll move now to defining these critical need areas, or as we're calling them, transit CNAs, critical need areas. Next slide. So three concepts uh, for defining these transit CNAs. Um, first, who is most likely to use transit from a propensity perspective? So here we're looking at demographics of the population that are likely to take transit for their commute. So we're, we're, we are focusing here on workers. Um, next up, we'll look at who is most likely to need transit from an equity perspective. Uh, so here we're not looking to commuters, but the population as a whole. Uh, that is likely to rely on transit to access the essential goods and services that they need, um, the truly transit dependent populations of our region. Uh, and then third, we'll look at what industries are most likely to need transit from a high mobility industry perspective. So uh, here we are still identifying people. So uh, we're looking at workers and where their home location is, but we're selecting people based on specific industries that we we know or, or we think we know will need a workforce that is in person and on site in the near future. So workers that will have to commute to their job, they can't work from home, uh, whether they're commuting by transit or in a car or on a bike, we don't know, but we're, that, that, that's who the third one is focusing on is workers that will have to leave home uh, to work. Next slide. So uh, the process, uh, we're starting with people because transit exists to, to move people. Um, we're looking at where people live because all trips start at home. Uh, and then we're focusing on areas that stand out because they have higher densities than the regional average for groups in these critical categories. We're using uh, a process called Z-scores to do this, which is a simple statistical tool that looks at how many standard deviations a value is from the average. Um, and we're applying the same process in all three options. So across the board, uh, we're looking at density because um, that's what transit needs, density. And then we're looking at areas that are above average. Um, areas that are below average, we're not focused on. And then uh, additionally, we're identifying individual demographics uh, and then creating a composite of multiple demographics. Uh, I wanna mention here as well that all of the methods we're employing are adopted from existing work uh, both academic and other peer agencies have employed. I'll get into specifics as we go through the work, um, but overall we are not reinventing market analysis, uh, but rather adapting existing work the RTA has done or others have done uh, to, to address the, the current moment that we're in. Next slide. So first up is uh, transit CNA or critical need area based on propensity. Um, here we are identifying workers that are likely to use transit for their commute. Um, again, both individual demographics and a composite of multiple, multiple demographics. Uh, the demographics come from existing RTA market analysis work that was adapted from methodology in TCRP 28, Transit Markets of the Future. Uh, these worker demographics are all linked to a higher propensity to commute via transit. Um, to reiterate, these are workers, but the demographics are agnostic to industry. We'll, we'll capture industries later. Uh, and then again, uh, the data here and the analysis are, are both uh, pre-COVID. Um, we, we had already identified these. This is not necessarily specific to COVID travel. Um, so those demographics are workers in the age cohorts of 20 to 44, African-American workers, uh, workers without a vehicle available for their, their commute, and then workers making a very, very low wage. Uh, the data here is coming from the US, uh, U.S. Census American Community Survey 2019. Next slide. So moving forward, I'll show a regional map on the left and a city inset for each demographic. And then again, we'll combine all of the demographics to form uh, the propensity transit CNA. Um, as a reminder, everything is measured with density. So the city is gonna light up the map a lot more as where there is the greatest population density, uh, the city of Chicago that is uh, in our region. Each value one through four represents this simplified Z-score. Uh, so a value of one is up to one standard deviation above average. Uh, as the numbers get higher, you're even higher above average. So first up is workers age 20 through 44. Um, which we can see uh, are somewhat spread throughout the region, but obviously the concentration uh, is within the city and then largely on the north side of the city. Next slide. Next up is African-American workers. 
Um, again, concentrations are showing up in the city, but we start to see some different patterns uh, from the previous. Uh, so the west and south sides of the city, as well as uh, west suburban Cook County, south suburban Cook County, and then some pockets throughout the collar counties as well. Next slide. So here is workers with no vehicle available. So uh, they don't have a car available for their commute. Uh, again, this is uh, really kind of combined uh, concentrated within city limits and along kind of the densest part of the city, the, the north side um, is where you see the most people in this situation. Next slide. And then very low wage workers, this measure again is workers that are employed, uh, but are actually making a wage at the poverty level. Um, this one you see is spread much more evenly throughout the region, um, a lot within the city, but then a lot of these pockets, uh, particularly some of the kind of satellite cities, uh, Joliet, um, Aurora and Elgin uh, all pop up on the map there. Next slide. And then this is the combination. So we're taking all of the tracks that score on one of the demographics and we're adding them up and we're creating what we're calling here the propensity transit CNA or critical need areas. So using, using a measure of propensity, saying who is likely to need transit for their work trip uh, these are the tracks uh, that we would want to preserve critical service for, that we would want to ensure that we're funding critical service to these areas within our region. So I'm going to move next to the, the next transit uh, CNA definition or concept, which is equity. It's a little bit different, but I'll pause here to see if we have any questions uh, before continuing. I am looking for hands. Um, at this time, I am not seeing any hands, so you may proceed. Great, next slide. So next up is equity, um, where propensity is focused on commuters and journey to work. Uh, the equity measure is looking more broadly at the population as a whole and identifying groups that rely on transit to access critical goods and services. Um, Again, uh, we're adapting existing work here, um, including research such as TCRP 214, uh, equity analysis and regional transportation planning. Uh, additionally, uh, peer agencies such as LA Metro have recently introduced transit equity measures um, to look at their population and understand how they're serving uh, people more specific to what their needs are. Uh, we're using the same treatment. Um, so we're looking for densities of demographics. We're using the simplified scoring to say what areas are above average, we're not focusing on any areas that are below average. Uh, the, the demographics that we're selecting here are seniors, population age 65 plus, uh, non-white population, low income households, so that would be a household uh, with an annual income of $35,000 or lower, ADA paratransit registrants. We're using ADA paratransit registrants in place of people that identify as having a disability uh, in census data. And the reason being is that census data is kind of notoriously tricky to capture the disability population with. Um, so instead we're using this, this paratransit registrants as kind of a proxy uh, for our region. And then lastly, uh, limited English proficiency population. So these are uh, the whole population, anyone five or older that lives in a household where both of the adults, heads of household, uh, if there are two, it could be one, uh, have limited English proficiency. Um, so it's not just the people, not just the adults, uh, but the, the children as well that would be captured in this. Again, the data is coming from US uh, Census, the American Community Survey 2019, and then the paratransit data comes from RTA Mobility Services. Next slide. So it's the same treatment here as the previous measure. Every area in gray is below average. We're not focused on that. Um, and then the one, two, three, four is how far above average. Um, first demographic here is senior population. Um, you can see it's quite spread throughout the region. And then the highest concentrations are in some of the high rise housing areas uh, along the lakefront in the city. Next slide. Non white population. Uh, again, um, the city shows greatest densities, but we see that uh, kind of spread to different areas of the city, west and south sides, as well as suburban Cook and then pockets uh, throughout the, the region more broadly. Next slide. 
low-income households. Um, again, uh, a lot in the city, but we do start to see more uh, pockets of this pop up in suburban Cook and the Collar counties. Next slide. ADA registrants, um, we do see this pretty well confined to the city um, to be to be able to use the ADA service. You do have to be within the service area of uh, CTA or PACE. Um, so we do see this constrained more directly to uh, city of Chicago and suburban Cook. Next slide. And then last up, limited English proficiency. This is the one where you really see it start to spread quite a bit more in, into suburban Cook and the Collar counties. Uh, re reflecting how diverse the suburbs are coming. Um, I think this map would have looked a, a little bit different uh, a few decades ago, um, but this does kind of capture some of that change. And then next slide. So then again, this is the, the score or the final composite. We take each individual demographic, we add them up and we, we identify areas that are above average and one or more of these uh, of these areas, and then this is what we're defining. We're saying these are uh, the equity transit CNAs. These are the areas uh, that have populations that are most likely to need critical service. This is the area that we would want to focus on preserving critical service uh, using an equity lens for, for the definition and for defining these areas. And I'll pause again um, if there are questions before moving on to the last one. I see um, Director Andalcio has a question. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, thank you, Peter. Peter, can you clarify for me a little bit on the data? Um, we're talking about getting data 2019 U.S. Census Survey and the RT Mobility Service 2020. I mean, as we're all aware, uh, dynamics have changed. There, there was a flux of folks leaving the city, getting into the suburbs. So just give me a little clarification to understand it a little bit better. Thank you. Sure. The, the U.S. Census data that we're using in, in all three measures is the most up to date we have. Um, you are acknowledging a challenge. Um, data is always going to be old. It's it's historical. Um, and that that's a challenge always in market analysis is trying to uh, understand what's happening now is oftentimes kind of impossible. Um, and that's, you know, that's some of the setup that we were using at the beginning with looking at where people are moving with, with the replica data and the transit ridership, which is current. Um, and then kind of using that to set the stage for, for looking at other measures. Um, but you're right, there, there is a, a limitation in, in what we're, what we have available to us. Okay, well, thank you for clarifying. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Director Melvin, you have a question. Go ahead. Yeah, um, just just as a follow up to um, Director Andalcio's question, um, you know, as I look at these these charts, uh, when you look at equity, when you look at the older population, when you look at the people without vehicles, when you look at the workers, you know, all these charts make sense. I think when we look at them, they sort of represent what we already know. Those those populations aren't that mobile. I think we also know that. So I would just throw that out there, that even though there may be some changes in there, there seem to be lots of nice homes being built. I'm, I'm not sure that the people who are captured here on the equity chart and the, uh, the essential workers chart on the South side of Chicago and the people who don't have vehicles are, are really the ones moving around. That's my only comment. Okay. Okay, um, at this point, I don't see any other hand, so I'll feel free to continue. All right, uh, next slide. So last one here, and this one's quicker, um, critical need based on industry. Before uh, proceeding into this one, um, the comments prompted me to, to uh, remind one thing, which is with all of these measures, um, we are looking for densities. Um, so we are, uh, there are people that fit these demographics spread throughout the region. Um, there are um, low income households everywhere. Um, there are, all of them are spread uh, throughout the region. Um, so 
the fact that so much of the map is gray is not to say that these uh, these people, these communities don't exist in areas, but it's more to say, again, we're focusing on where uh, there are above average densities uh, of these groups. Um, I just wanted to, to clarify that. Um, okay, so then the, the last one here is critical need based on industry. Um, so we're defining the transit CNA as tracks with above average worker counts for industries that we know are still operating or will be operating soon in person uh, as the economy begins to open back up. So here again, we're using um, established methods, the same treatment as, as previous. We're looking for densities using this kind of simplified Z-score, uh, but we're making industry selections based on what we know or, or what we're hearing about COVID impacts. So we're drawing on peers. Um, on real-time research that's happening, uh, the scenario work that we did over the summer, uh, talking to stakeholders in our region um, on survey data as it's available. Uh, but ultimately we are making some selections here. Um, so the industries that we're selecting are broader than kind of the state's definition of essential. Um, they include industries like healthcare, education, retail. Um, they do not include industries like professional services uh, or the fire industries. Um, jobs that we think uh, people will, will are likely to continue working from home. Um, they're jobs that don't require you to be there on site and in person. Again, the data here is from the US Census, although this is the longitudinal employment household dynamics file, uh, and it's 2018, which is again, the most up-to-date uh, vintage of this data set. Next slide. Um, so this one is just a single map, uh, again, um, the map on the left is the region, the right is the city inset, and where all of the areas in gray are below average, uh, they have lower densities of these types of workers. Again, this is home location, so this is not where the job is, this is where they live. Um, and then the colored areas of the map are where uh, the higher densities exist. Um, and as you can see, again, the you know, largely is confined to the most dense area of the city of Chicago, um, but then there are pockets in suburban Cook, uh, to Page County, and then some of these satellite cities uh, further out, Aurora shows up, uh, for example. Next slide. So I'll pause there um, for uh, any comments or questions. Again, we're, we have three, def three different definitions here. Propensity, so agnostic of industry or anything else, what workers are likely to commute. Uh, we have equity. So not workers, but just looking at the population broadly, who needs service, who needs help, who is a transit, transit dependent population. And then thirdly, what industries and where do their workers live uh, are likely to need people to be in person uh, and are gonna commute, whether that's by a transit or, or something else. Um, those are the three areas we're defining as critical, which we're then next going to relate to service. Um, okay, we'll hold there. please. Uh, Director Holt has a question. Thank you, Audrey. Peter, I've actually got two questions for you. Um, first one is, I, and I think I know, uh, but would you mind talking a little bit about um, how you're defining industries that uh, whose whose workers need, well, industries that are going to need transit to uh, for their workers to get on site? I mean, obviously, things like healthcare, um, but I'm interested in what other uh, industries are falling uh, the high mobility within that high mobility definition. Right, and this one um, is again one where we are drawing more heavily on the moment and what we know from talking to peers, what we know from uh, what what survey data exists, which is limited, and what research is already out there, um, and then also making some decisions just based on like, can you do that job from home? Um, so healthcare uh, education, um, you know, CPS is not back up yet, but we do think that it's going to happen this year that teachers will be returning to job sites, will no longer be teaching remotely. Um, it includes things like retail, uh, arts and entertainment, uh, restaurants. Um, we know those industries are, are hurting more so than many other industries because people can't work right now. Um, we, they may be down uh, employment wise, but we are including those industries in this measure um, as, as jobs that you do have to do in person. Okay, and I assume you uh, manufacturing, for example, is included yes, in that. Yes, for sure. Okay. Um, and then my other question was um, the 
slide that you had just previously where you were uh, talking about where those workers are located versus where the jobs are. How are you all thinking about the location of the jobs themselves, right? Because you may have a concentration of people who are in these roles in the city or in some of the, um, you know, in Joliet and Aurora and, play, and other uh, cities uh, in the region, but the jobs might not be located nearby, right? So there might be a reverse commute or uh, some other need of transit that isn't accurate, necessarily accurately reflected in their, their uh, where they live. And I'm curious to understand how you all are thinking about that issue. So uh, again, we're we're starting with the process of focusing on the people, um, mm -hmm. the and that's home locations for that reason. Uh, and then additionally, we're not focusing on the service planning efforts. So we are saying service boards, we trust that you guys know your markets, you know, know the regions that you're operating in. Um, we're going to look at the origin and where, where these critical people exist, and we're going to let you focus on the destination. Um, and then secondly, um, you know, our, the, the nature of the network is so oriented around the loop, um, mm -hmm. that the, it's kind of implied that the. Um, the service we're going to offer is oftentimes going to capture where a lot of these jobs exist uh, because so much of it is is uh, oriented in the kind of hub and spoke pattern. Great, thank you. Okay, one quick look. I, um, Director Holt, if you could lower your hand. Thank you. I do not see any additional questions at this time. So please proceed. Thank you. Uh, so now having these transit CNAs defined for our region, the next step is to relate this data to the provision of transit service that is again planned and delivered by the service boards. Um, so another way to think of this is the transit CNA represents the critical demand uh, and we're gonna now relate that demand to the critical service provided or the supply of service provided by the service boards. Next slide. To do this, we're drawing on GTFS data from the three service boards. Um, GTFS data is, is a standardized data specifications that all transit agencies produce. Uh, it's what powers things like Google Transit or the Transit app, um, any sort of trip planner. Um, from this data, you can plot kind of like a, a point or a ping for every time a transit vehicle makes a scheduled stop. Um, I'm gonna kind of quickly explain this. You don't need to understand uh, GTFS completely uh, to, to get what we're, what we're doing here, um, but we're essentially kind of aggregating pings. So aggregating every time a, a vehicle makes a stop, a scheduled stop by census tract um, to show both the presence of service. So does a line or a route uh, run through the census tract as well as how often does it stop? What is the measure of frequency? Does it come just in the morning for AM peak service or is it on 15 minute headways 24 um, seven? Because that is a different amount of service that is offered to uh, a specific area. Um, so this data source and method of aggregation uh, are similar in concept to what the FTA stops model does, which is used in project funding evaluation. Um, it's also very similar uh, to the accessibility tool that the RTA produces. Uh, the transit access measure. Um, it's also similar to uh, CMAP's uh, transit availability index. Uh, both tools are things that we use in project evaluation. Um, and then lastly, uh, we're weighting this aggregation of pings by expenditures. And we're using Q3 2020 expenditures for two specific reasons. Um, first, we're using Q3 uh, to reflect the current cost of operations. So uh, both changes to service levels uh, due to COVID impacts, as well as additional costs from COVID for PPE, sanitation, things like that. Um, and then secondly, and this is kind of the important thing, uh, weighting by cost allows us to adjust for the differences in modes. Um, so again, back the GTFS data for a bus looks way different than a train. A bus carries 40 people, uh, a train might carry a couple hundred. Uh, so we have to we have to kind of get them onto an equal playing field. We're using a uh, cost as our, our as our weight to be able to compare them to one another. Next slide. So this map shows regional pings by census tract. Um, so we're combining CTA metro and pace. Uh, we're saying does a, a route or line stop in this census tract? And then if so, how many times does it stop? And that's over a full week schedule. 
Uh, this data is pulled for December of 2020, so it reflects the service changes enacted by PACE and METRA. Um, and honestly, the map should look similar to other methods we we use for quantifying service, again, such as the transit access measure. So you see concentrations of service in the city in the loop, um, and then clusters around rail service into suburban Cook and the Colorado counties. Next slide. So uh, with this uh, kind of quantification of service, we can answer two important questions. Um, how well does the regional network serve transit CNAs? So we have those three definitions um, we talked about previously. Let's look at everything, CTA Metro and PACE together, and how well are we uh, serving those areas that we've identified as critical? And then secondly, of the regional network that is serving those critical areas, the transit CNAs, what proportion is operated by each service board? And any before I kind of go into the results, the output here, any questions about how we're aggregating service or how we're how we're uh, kind of explaining this? I'm taking a quick scan here. I do not see any hands, so you're good to go. Okay, next slide. So first up, we're looking at the propensity transit CNA. So the map is showing the areas in the region that we have identified as critical. We need to preserve transit in these areas uh, based on a measure of who's likely to commute for work, propensity for travel. Um, looking at the, our, the regional network as a whole, 77% of the regional network operates in these areas. Uh, so right off the bat, um, you know, we are addressing this, this critical area pretty well. Um, Looking at that, that portion that is serving these areas, um, then proportioning it out by the individual service boards. We can see about 79% of that is CTA, 18% is Metro, 3% is PACE. Next slide. So then up next is the equity transit CNA. So using uh, an equity lens for defining these critical areas, we're looking for populations that are truly transit dependent um, not not focus on workers, but the population broadly. Uh, that's the map on the left. 81% uh, of the regional network. So when we look at all three together, 81% of, of total service is operating within a, a census tract that we are defining as critical um, using equity. Dividing that up between the three service boards, about 79% is CTA, 17% Metra, 4% PACE. Next slide. And then lastly, the high mobility transit CNA. So again, this is worker home locations, but we're selecting workers based on these specific industries, things like healthcare and education, uh, manufacturing, transportation and logistics, uh, retail. Uh, and then we're again, it's density. Um, so looking at where these people live, about 56% of the regional network is serving census tracts that fall that are uh, you know critical need areas, uh, looking at this, this specific workforce. And then dividing up between three, it's 81% CTA, 16% Metro, 3% PACE. And then next slide. So in summary, this chart, this chart is showing the three uh, transit CNA definitions alongside one another. Um, it's, a, it's a little confusing to look at, but the length of the bar uh, again shows that total proportion. So if all three, uh, the whole regional network uh, serving the transit CNA, um, and then the proportion within that. Uh, and you can kind of get the comparison here um, between the three. With that, I would be uh, happy to answer any technical questions before turning it back to Jill uh, to summarize the next steps. Let me take a look here. I am not seeing any hands raised, so we are good. Oops, um, Director Gathing has a question. Go ahead. Hello. Um, so I'm wondering in looking at the data, if the population density in the city is overstating their transit needs versus the suburban population, which is more sparsely populated. But we have seen that for in PACE, for instance, we haven't seen as much of a drop in ridership as expected because there are essential workers that are using it uh, to get to their jobs. But I was just surprised that the PACE number was so low compared to CTA and Metro. Density is certainly um, 
the biggest attractor in kind of these definitions. Uh, the areas of PACES service that would perform best in these measures would m most serve these transit CNAs would be in those kind of collar cities or collar county cities, I should say. Um, so Joliet, uh, Aurora, Elgin, Waukegan. And these are some of the areas where um, that showed up green on their uh, ridership maps, um, kind of capturing um, that these are uh, areas where people are still riding uh, above the uh, above the regional average. Um, you know, some of the, the final slide here is also just reflecting the, the relative size of each service board to one another. Um, and uh, PACE operates over a huge area, but in total number of routes and trips um, and ridership, um, they are smaller than uh, CTA, for example. Thank you. Okay, let's see. Um, I don't see any other hands raised. If Director Gathering, if you could lower yours, thank you. Um, there are no other hand. Oops, Director Groven. Go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you. Just just a quick question. Can you please explain to us again what the percentage along the bottom of this last graphic is? Yeah. This is it's confusing. So thank you for asking. <laughs> so the, the gray, the gray percentage is if we look at regional network as a whole. Um, so uh, propensity uh, is about 77% of all transit. So um, combining the three service boards and then looking at the total amount of all transit that is hitting on these transit CNAs. So it's operating within these critical need areas. That's what the percentage on the bottom, it's the proportion of the total, um, it's about 77%. And then when you divide that up uh, between the three service boards, that's how you're getting the 79, 18, three, um, for, you know, and then the, the difference is for each one. All right, thank you. Okay, let me take one quick look again. I do not see any additional hands at this time, so um, we're good to proceed. I Great. will turn it back over to Jill. Thanks. Sounds good. I'll quickly uh, wrap this up and thanks to Peter for presenting this. So as I mentioned toward the beginning of the presentation when I was going over the recovery process, again, the purpose of this work is to gain regional consensus about the geographic areas in which it is critical to maintain tra transit presence throughout 2021. Now that we've gone, it, gone over it with you, uh, we will work on a proposed recommendations regarding relief funding, uh, relief fund distribution. We will present that to you in February and release it for public comment before your uh, consideration in March. Um, one other thing we will, as always, post these slides to our website and the presentation will be available on our website probably later today if anybody needs to review the material. So with that, that concludes our presentation and uh, happy to answer any, any final questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jill and Peter. Great presentation. I mean, it, this clearly shows, um, you know, the careful detail and study and analytics that we put into this, including uh, a major look at equity. Um, and uh, we just don't pull our, uh, you know, we don't we don't pull our service needs uh, out of thin air. I mean, this is a, a major study. It's well done, uh, and it's just uh, I, you know I often get asked, you know, how do you how do you determine where your service is? And you know, I try to talk about the tremendous amount of work that goes into analytics, and uh, this is just one example. So this is this is uh, excellent. It'll it'll give us great father for. Uh, discussion over the next month or two. So thank you, Joe, and thank you, Peter. Really, really, and staff, really well Mr. done. Chairman yes. Dillard, uh, Director Sager has a question as well as Director Melvin. So Director Sager would Excellent. kindly go first. Um, yes, can you hear me all right? Sure can. All right, I, I want to express my sincere appreciation for the depth of the data that was uh, presented in the analysis that was um, discussed. Peter, I think you've done an exceptional job of communicating that to us. And I find this all uh, incredibly interesting and very, very important data for us to take a look at. Um, the import of this discussion, I just want to make sure that we are absolutely clear 
in completely understanding that this is for critical need analysis in the critical period of time. So we, Peter kept talking about, uh, you know, the critical demand for the critical service and what's our critical response. And I think that that is in, incredibly important because we're really looking right now at this dependent time uh, that we find ourselves in. The challenge as a developmentalist from for me is the fact that there is a tendency then for us to react very, very strongly um, to this type of data in this particular time, but fail then to keep in mind that we are looking forward, that we always have to look forward as well. So there is a distinct need for us to um, maintain and to uh, foster the demand uh, that is critical for us at this period, but we also have to always think in terms of the future. You know, I'm biased here because as I looked at the McHenry County region up there, you know, there was very little illustration that said that McHenry County had any critical need at all. And of course, we understand that this is aggregated data, uh, et cetera, and it's, it's important to keep it in mind in that regard. And, and it is important for us to look at our critical response. But a lot of this, frankly, was predictable. I mean, the, the transit dependency is going to be focused in the uh, urban area. The uh, dependency upon CTA is going to be focused in the urban area. Uh, the higher density population areas are there. So that is logical and we understand all that. Um, but there is a variety of ways to interpret this, this data and there's a variety of ways to apply this data. My point, and I'm sorry for being verbose here, but my point is that I do want us to take this data and interpret it and apply it as it directly affects critical need analysis for critical time. But I don't want us to begin to take this and start to generalize it then across the board, especially as we're looking at long time, long term developmental efforts on behalf of transit in the, the region. So um, that's my point. I, I would uh, be interested in uh, other colleagues uh, perspective on that, that point. Thank you. Thanks, Doctor. Well said. Uh, Director Melvin also has his hand raised. So if, if Director Melvin and Director Sager could lower your hands at this time. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to say well done. I think you covered a lot of a lot of issues and you covered them very, very well. And they were great explanations and uh, it was it was very helpful. Once again, the staff, uh, Jill and Peter did a great job in uh, in 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 bringing out a lot of ideas and uh, explaining things. So I just want to say thank you. Thanks, Director Melvin. We're going to have good spirited discussion on this. I can I can I can I can tell. I think but so. Great, great, great presentation, and it and it does, you know, it shows me, it shows the public uh, that we 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 really take our role uh, in our analytics very seriously, uh, and we are focused on equity, and we will have a very transparent uh, process here as we move out of this pandemic. Okay, thank you very much. So next is uh, we only have one action item for today. Uh, and that's uh, um, a minor expense reimbursement. Are there any questions or comments on that? It's seven A on the uh, on the board agenda. If not, can I have a motion and a second that we approve this? Director Cotel moves, and Director Groven seconds. Thank you, uh, Audrey. Why don't you uh, take the roll then, please, on this? Okay, Director Andalcio. Aye. Director Canty? Aye. Director Carey? Aye. Director Colson? Aye. Director Frega? Aye. Director Fuentes? Aye. Director Gavin? Aye. Director Groven? Aye. Director Holt? Aye. Director Cotel? Aye. Director Lewis? Aye. Director Melvin? Yes. Director Pang? Yes. Director Ross? Yes. Director Sager? Yes. Chairman Dillard? Yes. 16 ayes.
Thank you. So that will be 7A is, is approved. Uh, thank you very much. Item eight is new business. Are there any, uh, is there any new issue or issues uh, to be raised uh, under this for discussion only today? Uh, checking for hands. I see no hands. Okay. Um, so as a reminder, our next scheduled meeting date for the RTA board will be uh, on Thursday, February 18th, beginning at nine. Uh, we'll see where we're at with respect to the status of uh, the office closure for COVID-19 uh, and where, uh, where where we go from there. Hopefully many more will be uh, vaccinated by then. Um, until then, um, I hope everybody stays uh, safe and healthy uh, and you uh, you have a very, very, very happy uh, new year. Uh, it is a, it's, a, it's a new time on so many fronts uh, in our country, in our region and um, you know, we, uh, you all on the board play a, uh, a critical component here. And I would encourage you, as Peter said, um, his presentation will be uh, up on the RTA uh, website. Uh, so, you know, you all have, for board members, you all have your own uh, folks that you talk to, your appointing authorities. Um, I would clearly uh, share uh, that data with, uh, with whomever you think uh, might be interested. So with that, if there's no further business to come before the public session of the Board of Directors, I will entertain a motion uh, and a second to adjourn. Director Andalcio moves. Thank and you, David. Director Melvin seconds. Thank you, Chris. Um, with that, uh, all those in favor of adjourning say aye or hit the little uh, leave, leave the meeting icon. Uh, uh, the, ayes, the ayes have it. And uh, Madam Secretary, 